This lesson covers the t-distribution and how it compares to the normal distribution, as well as a brief look at the student's t-distribution. For large samples, the normal distribution applies. For small samples, the standard deviation is measured in precisely, and the data follow the t-distribution. A t-distribution will approach a normal distribution for a larger n, greater than or equal to 100, but it has fatter tails for a smaller n, less than 100. The t-distribution is very similar to the standard normal distribution. It also has a bell curve, but the standard deviations are computed from the sample data instead of the population. Suppose a simple random sample of size n is drawn from a population whose distribution can be approximated by a normal mu sigma model. When the standard deviation is known, then the sampling model for the mean x is distributed as a normal distribution, with mean x bar and standard deviation sigma divided by the square root of n. When the standard deviation is estimated from the sample standard deviation s, the sampling model follows a t distribution with degrees of freedom n minus 1. This is the one sample t statistic. In this figure, both distributions have zero means, but the variances are a bit different. The t distribution has a lower peak and fatter tails. This concludes our video on t distributions. Today we covered the t distribution and showed how it is very similar to the normal distribution. We also briefly showed the student's t distribution. In this video, we will cover logistic regression, including the need for logistic regression, the logistic regression model, and odds, ratios, and prediction. In many instances, when you're testing hypotheses and making predictions, you will have dichotomous outcomes. For example, in a game, you can either win or lose. On a website, a user either clicks or does not click. In an election, a person votes for a candidate or does not. When the outcome variable is categorical, such as our game example, it does not follow a normal distribution. The outcome variable is a probability, measured between 0 and 1. The estimates you make should be numbers in that range. A linear model cannot be applied. We need a nonlinear function. There are many nonlinear models we can choose from to fit our data. Some nonlinear functions are shown here. The last one shown is the logistic function. That will fit the data the best because it has an upper and lower bound. Here's a logistic regression model in orange versus a linear regression model in blue. Isn't it a better fit for the data? To best suit our data, we want a model that predicts probabilities between 0 and 1, so it will be S-shaped. There are lots of S-shaped curves, but the logistic regression model is what we'll use in this instance. The logistic function is a nonlinear function of independent variables. However, we can convert this nonlinear function into a linear relationship using the log of the odds ratio. Note that instead of modeling just zeros and ones, we're modeling the probability of an event occurring. With the logistic regression model, instead of winning or losing, we build a model for log odds of winning or losing. It's a natural logarithm of the odds of the outcome. P stands for the probability of the outcome, while 1 minus P stands for the probability of not getting an outcome. However, having log of P over 1 minus P on the y-axis is not very helpful. We have to compute the actual odds. To do that, we have to use the exponential functions. Let's look at a very simple example of a log it function. Does alcohol drinking predict political party? Political party is the outcome variable, and it is binary. Therefore, we need a logistic regression. A typical log it equation contains the log of the odds ratio as the outcome, which is a linear function of the predictor's x. The log it model to measure the impact of drinking on voter choice is going to be set up as follows. The log of the odds ratio will be measured from data on x, where x here is the number of drinks per week. It's really important to understand that negative 1.4 is measuring the log of the odds ratio. In other words, it is the log of the probability of being Republican divided by the probability of not being a Republican. To get the actual odds ratio, you have to compute the exponent, which is equal to 0.25. Since the odds are less than 1, it tells us that the more you drink, the lower your odds of being Republican. All of these calculations can be done automatically in SAS, but it's important to understand the math behind what SAS is doing. The same model can be extended to more than one variable. We just add more predictors to the equation. 
The coefficient beta measures the impact of x on the log of the odds ratio. For example, in linear regression, if y equals 2 plus 3x, a 1 unit increase in x will increase y by 3 units. In a logistic regression, log p over 1 minus p minus 2 plus 3x shows us that if x increases by 1 unit, then the log odds of p, y equals 1, increases by 3 units. The impact on the odds ratio is represented by E exponent beta. We can also compute probabilities directly. To compute odds, we have to use the exponent. If we don't want to look at odds, but the actual probabilities, we apply the entire logistic function formula as shown in this probability function. These are the odds ratios and log of odds ratios for various probabilities. An important point to understand is how the odds ratios are tied to the probabilities. Note the mathematical equivalencies. A 50% probability, or probability of 0.5, is the same as 1 to 1 odds. The log of the odds ratio at that point is equal to 0. As probability increases, odds ratio increases from 0 to infinity, while the log of the odds ratio can become any value. This concludes our video on logistic regression. Today we covered the need for logistic regression, the logistic regression model, and odds ratios in prediction. This video will cover two types of statistical error, type 1 or alpha, and type 2 or beta. All statistics derived from samples are subject to error. A type 1 error rejects the null hypothesis when it is actually true. A type 2 error accepts the null hypothesis when it is not true. Remember that a different sample can give a completely different result. A sample mean is likely to fall in the confidence interval only 95% of the time, so the inferences drawn from the sample may be wrong. Let's talk in a little more detail about the type 1 error. The type 1 error occurs when a researcher thinks he or she has found a significant result, but really that result is due to chance. It's similar to a false positive on a drug test. The type 1 error, or the mistake of rejecting the true null hypothesis, will happen with a frequency of alpha. Thus, if alpha, our critical value, is 0.05, then a type 1 error will occur 5% of the time. On the other hand, a type 2 error occurs when results seem insignificant, but in fact there was something significant going on. Type 2 errors are like a false negative on a drug test. They occur when the alternative hypothesis is true, but there's not enough evidence in the sample to reject the null hypothesis. This type of error is traditionally considered less important than a type 1 error, but it can lead to serious consequences in real situations. The power of a test is 1 minus the probability of a type 2 error. It is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when the alternative hypothesis is true. In these competing sampling distributions, alpha is set to 0.05. The bottom curve assumes HA is true. The top curve assumes that the null hypothesis H0 is true. Its right tail shows that we will reject H0 when a sample mean exceeds 189.6. The probability of getting a value greater than 189.6 on the bottom curve is 0.5160 corresponding to the power of the test. Here's a table that summarizes the types of errors. Here's an example using a fire alarm. If a fire alarm is silent and there is no fire, our null hypothesis that it is working is correct. But what if the assumption is wrong? Then we have accepted the null hypothesis, but we actually have a fire. That's our type 1 error. The opposite case may also happen. If the alarm goes off and there's actually a fire, there's no error. But if there's no fire and the alarm goes off, it's a false alarm. That's the type 2 error. Here it is a less serious problem. This concludes our video on statistical error. Today we discussed type 1 or alpha error and type 2 or beta error. This video will cover hypothesis testing, which is also called significance testing, and occurs when we test a claim about a population parameter using sample evidence that confirms or rejects the claim. There are four steps in the hypothesis testing process, all of which will be covered in this video.
Here's a summary of the four steps in hypothesis testing. After this, we'll discuss each step in detail. The first step is stating the null and alternative hypotheses. We have to establish what we are testing to be true. Once we do that, we have to decide how close to true our sample statistic has to be for us to accept the truth. For example, we might want our estimate to be accurate with a 5% margin of error. This is called locating the critical region. Once we know that, we have to compute the test statistic, the z-value, or the t-value. Finally, based on our results, we draw conclusions from the study. The first step in the procedure is to convert the research question into a statement of the hypotheses null and alternative forms. Our study will be to collect and seek evidence against the null hypothesis as a way of deductively bolstering the alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis, abbreviated H0, is a statement of no difference. In other words, the null hypothesis argues that there is no significant difference between our specified populations and that any observed difference is due to sampling or experimental error. The alternative hypothesis, or HA, is the opposite of the null hypothesis. It provides a statement of difference. In our study, we will seek evidence against the claim of H0 as a way of proving HA. Here's an example of setting up the null and alternative hypotheses. In the late 1970s, the weight of U.S. men between 20 and 29 years of age had a log normal distribution with a mean of 170 pounds and a standard deviation of 40 pounds. To illustrate the hypothesis testing procedure, we ask if body weight in this group has changed since 1970. This is called our research question, and it can be answered in one of two ways. Under the null hypothesis, there is no difference in the mean body weight between then and now, in which case mu would still equal 170 pounds. Under the alternative hypothesis, we assert that the mean weight has changed. Mu is not equal to 170 pounds. This is called a two-sided test, the most common form of hypothesis testing. We can also do a one-sided test in which we ask if weight has increased over time, so the alternative hypothesis would be mu is greater than 170 pounds. In step two, we will locate the critical region. Once we've established the research question, we have to define the level of accuracy with which we want to measure our test statistic. Any estimate from a sample will not be exactly the same as the population parameter, so we have to decide what we think is likely versus unlikely. This is called locating the critical region. The critical region consists of outcomes that are very unlikely to occur if the null hypothesis is true or in other words, the sample means that are almost impossible to obtain. When we're estimating population parameters using a sample, we have to determine the cutoff values. These cutoff values are called alpha. If we decide that we want to measure the mean with a 90% precision level, then the shaded area on the left and right will be larger. If we want to measure with a 1% precision, then the area will be smaller and the range will be larger. These are the locations of the critical region boundaries for three different levels of significance. Alpha equals 0.05, alpha equals 0.01, and alpha equals 0.001. Note that boundaries get wider as the critical value falls. In most cases, researchers choose an alpha of 0.05 or 0.01. Our rejection region should have a probability of alpha if the null hypothesis is true, but some bigger probability if the alternative hypothesis is true. So if the mean lies inside the cutoff value for alpha, then the null hypothesis is true. Otherwise, we fail to accept the null hypothesis. The result is significant beyond the alpha level. For example, if alpha is 0.05, our result is significant if it's less than 0.05. Once we decide whether we want to measure accuracy at the 10%, 5%, or 1% level, we can compute the test statistic. Here we will use the z-score, which is a ratio comparing the obtained difference between the sample mean and the hypothesized population mean. This is an example of a one-sample test of a mean when the standard deviation sigma is known. In our male weights example, we're going to use the z-statistic because we know the population mean and the population standard deviation. To compute the z-statistic, we simply insert values derived from our sample into the formula. If in one sample we found that the sample mean was 173, then the z-statistic would be 0.60. Think of this value on the x-axis under a standard normal curve. Let's say we found the sample mean to be 185. Putting these values into the z-stat formula, we find the z-stat is 3.0. This is much higher at the tail end of the x-axis on a normal distribution. The final step is drawing conclusions. Once we've computed the z-value of our test statistic, we have to look at the corresponding probability values to find out if it's reasonably close to the population mean. A large value shows that the obtained mean difference is large and in the critical region. 
The difference is significant, which means we have to reject the null hypothesis that the weights have not changed over time. If the mean difference is relatively small, then the test statistic will have a low value. In this case, we conclude that the evidence from the sample is not sufficient, and the decision is to fail to reject the null hypothesis. The p-value is the area under the normal curve in the tails beyond the z-stat. It answers the question, what is the probability of the observed test statistic or one more extreme when h naught is true? To convert z statistics to p-value, we will use software. In one sample with a sample mean of 173, the z statistic was 0.60. If we had this sample, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis that the mean weights have increased over time. Likewise, if we computed the p-values for z equals 3.0, we would get 0 0.001, which means we have to reject the null hypothesis that the mean weight has remained the same over time. Note that when we're looking at weight change instead of weight increase, all we have to do is multiply the one-sided p-value by 2 to do a two-tailed test. Since we will be using p-values in all our subsequent analysis, it's worth emphasizing what that means. p-values ask the question, what is the probability of the observed test statistic when h naught is true? Remember, the smaller the p-value, the more likely that your null hypothesis is not true. This graphic depicts the significance of p-values at less than 1%, between 1 and 5%, between 5 and 10%, and greater than 10%. These are common significance levels. 5% is the most common cutoff. However, note that it's unwise to draw firm borders for significance. As an example, a p-value of 0.27 would not be significant against H0. A p-value of 0.01, on the other hand, would be highly significant against H0. This concludes our video on hypothesis testing, also called significance testing, which occurs when we test a claim about a population parameter using evidence that confirms or rejects that claim. Today we covered the four steps in hypothesis testing. State the null and alternative hypotheses, locate the critical region, compute the test statistic, and draw conclusions. This presentation will cover correlation, including a definition of correlation, a discussion of the need for correlation, details on computing correlation, including variance, covariance, and the correlation coefficient, strength of association, linear and curvilinear relationships, properties of correlation, R squared, the coefficient of determination, and a discussion of correlation versus causation. Correlation is one of the most common and useful statistics. It's a measure of association, a single number that describes the degree of relationship between two variables. We can examine correlations between two variables heuristically by looking at a scatter chart. In this chart, our observations are very tightly centered around the line. In this case, we would say that the relationship between x and y is more correlated. We call this a strong correlation. By contrast, if the observations are scattered further out, we might say the relationship between x and y is less correlated, or that there is a weak correlation. Here are some examples of questions that ask about correlation. Is there any association between hours of study and grades? Is there any association between the number of churches in a city and the murder rate? When the weather gets hot, what happens to sweater sales? What is the strength of association between them? What about the sale of ice cream versus temperature? What is the strength of association between them? Furthermore, how do we quantify the association? While we can guess the relationship, there's a better way to do this using statistical measures. The measure we use is the Pearson correlation coefficient. To compute correlation, we'll need information on standard deviation and covariance. We know that the variance is the dispersion within a variable x or y, or the squared average deviation from the mean, as shown here. The covariance is the dispersion of x multiplied by the dispersion in y. It is calculated as the average of the product of deviations in individual means. Using the information on variance and covariance, we can compute the correlation coefficient as the covariance of x and y divided by the standard deviation of x multiplied by the standard deviation in y. This measure of correlation ranges from negative 1 to positive 1. A higher number is a stronger correlation, 
and a lower number is a weaker correlation. Correlation coefficient r measures the strength of linear association. It measures the extent to which two variables are proportional to each other. It's unit-free, so for example, a measure of correlation between player height measured in inches and player weight measured in pounds will be meaningful even if they're measured in different units. Here are some examples. No linear association, negligible negative association, weak positive association, moderate negative association, very strong positive association, very strong negative association. In these scatter plots, what is happening to y as x is increasing? An important point to remember is that correlation is a measure of linear association. If the relationship is curvilinear, using the correlation measure is not appropriate. If x changes and y stays the same, then the correlation is zero. Since the correlation measure is a measure of linear association, we cannot use correlations on categorical data. It's related to sample size, and it's also very sensitive to outliers. The correlation measure r measures the strength of linear association. Squaring the correlation coefficient gives us r squared, which is the coefficient of determination. It is the proportion of common variation in two variables. This measures the strength or the magnitude of the relationship. While we cannot use percentage to interpret r, we can do so for r squared. For example, if r squared equals 67%, then we can say that 67% of variation in x is related to variation in y. Correlation does not imply causation. It's easy to see that in this chart, the Internet Explorer market share correlates with the murder rate in the US, but that doesn't mean that one caused the other. Causal relationships are determined based on facts and business models. We cannot determine causality from data. Correlation is a mathematical formula. You will get a number no matter what data you feed. First, you need to establish a logical relation and then find the correlation. Variables may be correlated if they have a causal relationship. For example, water causes plants to grow. Correlation can also occur when one variable is both the cause and the effect. For example, coffee consumption can cause nervousness, but it's possible that nervous people also drink more coffee. Correlation can also be high because both variables move together due to a missing third variable. For example, this comparison of deaths due to drowning and soft drink consumption during summer. Both variables are related to heat and humidity, a third variable not shown here. Omitting such variables can be dangerous. Here's a look at some additional measures of correlation using scatter charts. This concludes our video on correlation. Today we discuss the definition of correlation, the need for correlation, details on computing correlation, including variance, covariance, and the correlation coefficient, strength of association, linear and curvilinear relationships, properties of correlation, r-squared, the coefficient of determination, and correlation versus causation. This video will cover binomial distributions, which are a type of discrete distribution. We will first compare discrete and continuous distributions of a single random variable, and then we'll look at the binomial distribution specifically. There are two types of random variables, discrete and continuous. A discrete random variable has only a finite number of possible values, whereas a continuous random variable has a continuum of possible values. Usually a discrete distribution results from a count whereas a continuous distribution results from a measurement. The distinction between counts and measurements is not always clear-cut. A probability distribution is simply a mapping of all distinct events for a variable and their probability of occurrence, such as the distribution of a coin flip experiment. The form of the distribution depends on whether the variables are discrete or continuous. Here are some examples of discrete variables, outcomes of dice rolls, whether a customer likes or dislikes a product, or the number of hits on a website. Some examples of continuous variables include the weekly change in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, daily temperature, or the time between machine failures. To specify the probability distribution of event x, we need to specify all of its possible values and their probabilities. We assume that there are k possible values and write out our list of possible values like this. A typical value is denoted like this, 
and the probability of a typical value is denoted like this. Next, we will discuss distributions of both discrete and continuous variables. For each type of variable, distributions can be characterized by three measures, mean, variance, and standard deviation. These are formulas for working with discrete distributions. While we won't be computing these measures by hand, you do need to be aware of the formulas. The mean, also called the expected value, is calculated with this formula. The mean is a weighted sum of all possible values, weighted by their probabilities. Mean is denoted by the Greek letter mu. The variance is a weighted sum of the squared deviations of the possible values from the mean, where the weights are, again, the probabilities. The standard deviation is simply the square root of the variance. Standard deviation is denoted by the Greek letter sigma. These are the formulas for working with continuous distributions. A probability distribution visually summarizes the probabilities associated with all possible events for a variable. We will focus on three probability distributions that are commonly used in explaining real-world events. Binomial and exponential distributions are used with discrete data, while normal distributions are used with continuous data. A binomial distribution is a discrete distribution that represents the number of successes in n independent trials, each of which has the probability of success p. Each trial has a binary outcome. For example, a coin toss yields either heads or tails. The probability of either observation, heads or tails, is the same each time we toss the coin. These outcomes are generally called success and failure. The probability of success is p, and the probability of failure is 1 minus p. The distribution maps the outcome of all the trials. Each trial has to be independent, and the probability of success has to be the same for each trial. This is the probability mass function formula for a binomial distribution. If we toss a coin 100 times, what is the probability that we will get 40 heads? What is the probability of getting 90 heads? That probability can be computed by applying this formula. We have only two possible outcomes, 1, 0, or success failure, in n independent trials. This formula depicts the probability of exactly x successes. n is the number of trials. x is the number of successes out of n trials. p is the probability of success. And 1 minus p is the probability of failure. All probability distributions are characterized by an expected value and variance. If we toss a coin 100 times, what would be the average number of heads we would get? What about the variance? These are computed using these formulas. You'll often see the assumptions of normal distribution being applied to discrete outcomes. This is because the binomial distribution approximates to a normal distribution for large samples. So for large enough samples, we can calculate probabilities using normal probability rules. This concludes our video on binomial distributions. Today we covered discrete and continuous distributions of a single random variable and the binomial distribution. This video will cover normal distributions, the probability density function, cumulative distribution functions, the 68-95-99.7 rule, and standardizing z-values. The single most important distribution in statistics is the normal distribution. It is a continuous distribution, and it's the basis of the familiar symmetric bell-shaped curve. The mean of the normal distribution is in the center. The standard deviations are marked at equal distances from the mean. Any particular normal distribution is specified by its mean and standard deviation. By changing the mean, the normal curve shifts to the left or the right. By changing how spread out the standard deviations are, the curve also changes. Standard deviations can be spread out wider or closer together. Therefore, there are really many normal distributions, not just a single one. The normal distribution is a two-parameter family, where the two parameters are the mean and the standard deviation. Here's a tool you can play with online that illustrates a normal distribution. In real life, it looks like a triangular-shaped pegboard into which balls are dropped. When there's an equal probability that the balls will drop either left or right, their final placement forms a normal distribution. However, when the probability of the balls dropping left or right is unequal, which is something you can experiment with using this tool, the distribution changes.
The formulas for mean and standard deviation are very complex, but you will not have to compute them because the software will. With continuous variables, there is a continuum of possible values, such as all values between 0 and 100, or all values greater than 0. Instead of assigning probabilities to each individual value in the continuum, the total probability of 1 is spread over this continuum. Thus, the shaded area within the bell curve will always have an area of 1. The key to this spreading is called a density function, which acts like a histogram. The higher the value of the density function, the more likely this region of the continuum is. A density function, usually denoted by fx, specifies the probability distribution of a continuous random variable x. The higher fx is, the more likely x is. Probabilities are found from a density function as areas under the curve. So for example, the shaded portion under this bell curve represents the probability of x being between 65 and 75. The cumulative distribution function, or CDF, is the probability that the variable takes a value less than or equal to x. It is the total area under the normal curve up to x. Here's an example. The beauty of the normal curve is that no matter what its mean and standard deviation are, the area between the mean minus 1 standard deviation and the mean plus 1 standard deviation is always about 68%. The area between the mean minus 2 standard deviations and the mean plus 2 standard deviations is always about 95%. And the area between the mean minus 3 standard deviations and the mean plus 3 standard deviations is always about 99.7%. That means almost all values fall within three standard deviations on either side of the mean. This is true for all normal curves, no matter their shape. But how good is this rule for real data? Let's go ahead and check out an example. Here's our data. The mean of the weight of 120 women runners in a sample is 127.8 pounds. The standard deviation is 15.5. Here's what our distribution would look like. Let's look a little more closely at that distribution. 68% of our 120 runners is about 83 runners. According to the 68.95.99.7 rule, those runners should all fall within one standard deviation of the mean weight of 127.8. That is, 83 of our runners should fall between 112.3 and 143.3 pounds. When we check our data, we see that 79 runners fall within one standard deviation of the mean. Furthermore, 95% of our group, or about 114 runners, should fall within two standard deviations of the mean, or between 96.8 and 158.8 pounds. The data shows that 115 runners fall within two standard deviations of the mean. Finally, according to the rule, 99.7% of our runners, or 119.6 runners, should fall within three standard deviations of the mean, or within a range of 81.3 pounds to 174.3 pounds. According to our data, all 120 runners fall within this range, so it seems as if the rule is pretty accurate in this case. There are indefinitely many normal distributions, one for each pair of standard deviation and mean. One particular combination of standard deviation and mean deserves special attention, and that is the standard normal distribution. All normal distributions can be converted into the standard normal curve by subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation but all of the integrals for the standard normal distribution have been calculated and put into a table for us, and we also have software to help us out, so we never have to integrate the long way. This diagram illustrates the conversion of x values into z values, when we convert a normal distribution to a standard normal distribution. Here's a practice problem. If birth weights in a population are normally distributed with a mean of 109 ounces and a standard deviation of 13 ounces, what is the chance of obtaining a birth weight of 141 ounces or heavier when sampling birth records at random? Here's how we solve this problem. We subtract 109, our mean, from 141, and then divide by our standard deviation, 13. So z equals 2.46. Then we will use the norm dist function in Excel to discover that our value for z, 2.46, equals 0 0.993. The chance of a baby being born heavier corresponds to the right tail of the distribution, so the probability that we will get a value for z that's greater than or equal to 2.46 can be discovered by subtracting our value for z, 0.993, from the total area of the standard distribution, 1. This concludes our video on normal distributions, continuous distributions, density functions, cumulative distribution functions, the 6895 99.7 rule and standardizing z values.
This video will cover populations and inferences, sampling error, and the central limit theorem. A population is the set of all members about which a study intends to make inferences. Here's a population of people. We'd like to study their television watching behavior to determine how many watch a particular show so we can decide whether to purchase advertising spots during this period of time. But our population is much too large for a feasible study. To study their television viewing habits, we will have to survey them, and it's not feasible to survey every single individual. So instead, we'll take a sample of the population to study. Choosing a representative sample, we can make some inferences about the population behavior. But it's unlikely that one sample can provide accurate measures of behavior for the entire population. An estimate of the population parameter, or the proportion watching a television show, is likely to be different for different samples of the same size, and is likely to be different from the population parameter. This is called sampling error. The sampling error is unknown, but we can estimate the extent of this error by applying the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem tells us that what we know about our sample can tell us about the larger population the sample came from. For any results that are generated from samples, we get a range of estimates of a population parameter, which includes mean and standard deviation, from each sample. In our example, it would be an estimate of the proportion watching a particular TV show. These estimates have their own distribution, and the central limit theorem tells us that the distribution looks like a bell curve. The central limit theorem makes predicting outcomes a lot easier. If the sample size is large enough, then the sampling distribution of the mean is approximately normally distributed, regardless of the distribution of the population. If all possible random samples, each of size n, are taken from any population with a mean mu and a standard deviation sigma, the sampling distribution of the sample means, or averages, will have a mean, have a standard deviation, and be approximately normally distributed, regardless of the shape of the parent population. Remember that normality improves with a larger n, and it all comes back to z. Note the symbols here. The mean of the sample means is noted as mu of x bar. The standard deviation of the sample means is written as sigma of x bar, and is also called the standard error of the sample mean. That concludes our video. Today we covered populations and inferences, sampling error, and the central limit theorem. In this video, we will first define probability, then we will cover the rule of complements, the addition rule, probabilistic independence, conditional probability, and the Bayes theorem. A probability is a number between 0 and 1 that measures the likelihood that some event will occur for a random variable. An event with probability 0 cannot occur, whereas an event with probability 1 is certain to occur. An event with probability greater than 0 and less than 1 involves uncertainty. Here are some examples the odds of winning a lottery, the likelihood of a particular candidate winning an election, or the chance of rolling a four on a fair die. In the case of the die, there are six sides, so the odds of rolling a four are one out of six. The complementary rule in probability is simply the probability of an event not occurring. If A is any event, the probability of A is P of A. The complement of A is the event that A does not occur. The probability of the complement of A is shown by this equation, 1 minus the probability of the event occurring. In our dice example, the probability of getting a 4 was 1 in 6, so the probability of not getting a 4 is 1 minus 1 in 6, which equals 5 in 6. The addition rule of probability involves the probability that at least one of the events will occur. Events are exhaustive if they exhaust all possibilities. One of the events must occur. For example, when we roll a six-sided die, we will always end up with a number between one and six. We say that events are mutually exclusive if at most one of them can occur. For example, you can't roll a three and a six on one die at the same time. If you have two mutually exclusive events, like our three and six, then the probability of either one occurring is the sum of the two separate probabilities. If two events are independent or their outcomes aren't affected by each other, then the probability of both A and B occurring is simply the product of the two probabilities. In the case of our die, the probability of getting a 6 on the first roll and getting a 3 on the second roll is 1 in 6 times 1 in 6, which equals a 1 in 36 chance. Sometimes the probability of one event will affect another. These are called dependent events, and their probabilities are called conditional. This is the formula for conditional probability. The conditional probability of A conditional that B has already occurred, is equal to the joint probability of both of the events occurring together, divided by the probability of B occurring, without regard to whether A has occurred or not. The Bayes theorem allows us to estimate posterior probabilities once we obtain new data. With it, we can measure the likelihood of event H occurring once we obtain particular pieces of evidence from data D. 
The parts of the theorem include the independent probability of H, or prior probability, the independent probability of D, the conditional probability of D given H, or likelihood, and conditional probability of H given D, or posterior probability. This concludes our video on basic probability. Today we defined probability and covered the rule of complements, the addition rule, probabilistic independence, conditional probability, and the Bayes theorem. In this video, we will cover variable roles, including explanatory and outcome variables, and variable classification, including qualitative variables, nominal, ordinal, and binary, and quantitative variables, discrete, continuous, interval, and ratio. Any analytics project first begins with a question. What is the problem we are trying to solve? To address that question, we need to collect data. The next step in the process is to understand the data collected and only then can we move to further steps of data cleaning, data analysis, and solving the problem. A key step in understanding the information collected is to identify all the variables in the data set. We need to know what variable types we have in order to make them amenable to further analysis. Variables have two possible roles. The first is explanatory. Explanatory variables are also called features or independent variables. These are variables that are used as inputs to explain the variation in the outcome variable. The second role a variable can take on is outcome. An outcome variable is also known as a target or dependent variable. These are variables that measure the output or impact that's being studied. Most studies have many independent variables and one dependent variable. For example, a person's weight could be a function of age, gender, and calories consumed. Fuel efficiency is a function of features such as car size, weight, and number of cylinders. Restaurant ratings are a function of food quality, ambiance, and service. Variables can be qualitative or quantitative. Qualitative data can be nominal, ordinal, or binary. Quantitative data can be discrete or continuous, with either an interval or ratio level of measurement. We'll start by discussing how to determine whether a variable is qualitative or quantitative. The best way to decide whether a variable is qualitative or quantitative is to use the subtraction test. If two experimental units, such as people, have different values for a particular measure, then you should subtract the two values and ask yourself about the meaning of the difference. For example, when hair color is coded as 1 equals blonde, 2 equals red, 3 equals brown, and 4 equals black, the difference between the variables has no meaning, so it fails the subtraction test, which means hair color is a categorical or qualitative variable. However, if the difference is meaningful, then it is a quantitative variable. For example, age in years. The differences between these numbers have a meaning, so the variable is quantitative. We will now discuss qualitative variables in detail. Categorical variables are those that have only a few possible values, thus assigning each value to a particular group or category. For example, oceans are a categorical variable. Nominal and ordinal variables are often called labels. A nominal variable has levels with arbitrary names, for example, car colors. Ordinal variables have a logical order, for example, exam grades. A dichotomous or binary variable is a categorical variable that has only two levels or categories, often the answer to a yes or no question. But a variable doesn't have to be a yes-no variable to be binary, it just has to have only two categories, such as gender. We will now discuss quantitative variables in detail. Quantitative variables are those for which the recorded numbers encode magnitude information based on a true quantitative scale. They can be discrete or continuous. A discrete variable has only whole number counts. A continuous variable can take on any value on the number scale. To determine whether a variable is discrete or continuous, use the midway test. If for every pair of values of a quantitative variable, the value midway between them is a meaningful value, then the variable is continuous. Otherwise, it's discrete. For example, age is continuous because the difference between ages 20 and 30 is meaningful. An example of a discrete variable is the number of children in a family. You can see here that 2.5 does not make sense. The interval level of measurement ranks data. It can be either discrete or continuous. With interval variables, precise differences between units of measure exist, but there's no meaningful zero. For example, take IQ scores. It makes sense to talk about someone having an IQ 50 points higher than another person, but an IQ of zero has no meaning. 
Ratio variables are interval variables, but with the added condition that zero of the measurement indicates that there is none of that variable. True ratios exist when the same variable is measured on two different members of the population. For example, consider the weight of an individual. It makes sense to say that a 150-pound adult weighs twice as much as a 75-pound child. However, it doesn't make sense to say that 70 degrees Fahrenheit is twice as hot as 35 degrees Fahrenheit, so temperature is not a ratio variable. This concludes our video on variables. In this video, we covered variable roles, including explanatory and outcome variables, and we also covered variable classification, including qualitative variables, nominal, ordinal, and binary, and quantitative variables, discrete, continuous, interval, and ratio. This video will cover basic information about coding, coding systems, and types of variables in coding, including binary, ordinal, nominal, and continuous. Coding is the process of translating the information gathered from questionnaires and other investigations into something that can be analyzed, usually using a computer program. Coding involves assigning a value to the information given in a questionnaire, and often that value is given a label. Coding can make the data more consistent. For example, if you ask the question, what gender, you might end up with the answers male, female, M, F, etc. Coding will avoid such inconsistencies. A common coding system for binary variables is the following. 0 equals no, and 1 equals yes, where the number is the value assigned, and the yes or no is the label of that value. Some like to use a system of 1s and 2s, where 1 equals no and 2 equals yes. This brings out an important point in coding. When you assign a value to a piece of information, you must also make it clear what the value means. In the first example, 1 equals yes, but in the second example, 1 equals no. Either way is fine, as long as it's clear how the data are coded. You can make it clear by creating a data dictionary as a separate file to accompany the data set. A binary variable is any variable that is coded to have two levels, like this example. In SAS, data representing gender, coded as MF, would be converted into a binary variable. Here's an example. If we're asking about the number of years of education a person has, with a value of 1 for each year of education, that would mean anyone with more than 12 years of education has been to college, and anyone with less than 12 years of education has not been to college. We can recode into a binary yes-no variable by saying that if education is greater than 12, that implies that college equals 1. Otherwise, college equals 0. This type of coding is useful in descriptive and predictive analytics. The coding process is similar with other categorical variables. For the variable education, we might code as follows. 0 equals did not graduate from high school, 1 equals high school graduate, 2 equals some college or post-high school education, and 3 equals college graduate. Note that for this ordinal categorical variable, we need to be consistent with the numbering because the value of the code assigned has significance. The higher the code, the more educated the respondent is. In SAS, we would convert years of education to education categories like this. Here's an example of what not to do. 0 equals some college or post-high school education, 1 equals high school graduate, 2 equals college graduate, and 3 equals did not graduate from high school. Can you tell what's wrong with this example? The data we're trying to code has an inherent order, but the coding in this example does not follow that order. Here's the correct way to do it. For nominal categorical variables, however, the order makes no difference. Here's an example. For the variable reside, 1 equals northeast, 2 equals south, 3 equals northwest, 4 equals midwest, and 5 equals southwest. It doesn't matter what order we use for these categories. Midwest can be coded as 4, 2, or 5 because there's not an ordered value associated with each response. Continuous variables are usually left in the same format as they are in the original dataset. However, be careful about missing values and miscoded data. You may also need to code responses from fill-in-the-blank and open-ended questions. With an open-ended question such as, why did you choose not to see a doctor about this illness, respondents will all answer differently. Also, you may give response choices for a particular question, but offer an other specify option as well, where respondents can write whatever response they choose. These types of open-ended questions can be a lot of work to analyze. One way to analyze the information is to group together responses with similar themes. For the question, why did you choose not to see a doctor about this illness, responses such as, didn't feel sick enough to see a doctor, 
symptoms stopped, and the illness didn't last very long could all be grouped together as the illness was not severe. You will also need to code don't know responses. Typically, don't know is coded as nine. That concludes our video on coding with variables. Today we covered some basic information about coding, coding systems, and types of variables in coding, including binary, ordinal, nominal, and continuous. This video will cover using graphs to understand data. We will cover three types of graphs, bar charts, box plots, and histograms. It's important to know which graph to use. If the variable is categorical, look at it using a bar chart. If it is continuous, you should examine it using either a box and whisker plot or a histogram. A bar chart translates the data from frequency tables into a pictorial representation. It depicts categorical variables and shows frequency or proportion in each category. This bar chart looks at the frequency distribution of patients with pulmonary embolism, which occurs when one or more arteries in the lungs gets blocked by a blood clot. Notice that this is a binary variable with only two possible responses, yes and no. Yes is coded as one and no is coded as zero. The frequency distribution of a binary variable shows the number of patients in each group. It's much easier to extract information from a bar chart than from a table. This chart depicts shock index, which is the ratio of heart rate to blood pressure and should lie between 0.5 and 0.8. The higher it is, the greater the risk. Shock index is an ordinal categorical variable. The vertical bars here represent the number of patients in each category. The shape of a distribution describes how the data are distributed. Measures of shape include symmetric and skewed. The first thing we're looking for in any continuous variable is the shape of distribution. What are the boundaries of the data points? And how are they clustered? If a few small values are mixed in with a majority of values being much higher, the data will have a left or negative skew. Likewise, if we have some large values mixed in with a majority of small values, the distribution will have a right skew, or we say it is positively skewed. If the distribution is balanced, it is symmetric. We can also observe skewness by inspecting the values. For instance, consider the numeric sequence 49, 50, 51, whose values are evenly distributed around a central value of 50. This produces a symmetric shape. We can transform this sequence into a negatively skewed distribution by adding a value far below the mean, 40, 49, 50, 51. This produces a left skew. Similarly, we can make the sequence positively skewed by adding a value far above the mean, 49, 50, 51, 60. This produces a right skew. A box and whisker plot provides an easy way to examine the entire distribution of a variable, and it's also very useful when we want to examine relationships between two variables, where one is categorical and another is continuous. Let's look at the box first. The bottom of the box represents the 25th percentile, while the top of the box represents the 75th percentile. The line in the middle represents the median. The bigger the box, the greater the spread of the data. The whiskers in the box plot do not necessarily represent the minimum and maximum values. They show the minimum and maximum only if these values are less than one and a half times the interquartile range. If the values are bigger than that, the whiskers represent 1.5 times the interquartile range, or IQR. Values outside that range are represented as dots. In the example here, note that there are many dots above the top whisker. This is a quick and easy way to check for outliers. We can look at the same shock index data with a histogram. The dots in the box plot showed us that there were several large values greater than 1.5 times the interquartile range. The same is represented in this histogram, with the right skew. There's no single rule of thumb for choosing bin sizes. The bin sizes you choose will depend on the research question you're asking. Here, using 100 bins shows too much detail, and it's not useful. Likewise, too few bins tells us little about the underlying shape of the distribution. This example uses two bins and provides too little detail. Note that the box plot we looked at earlier shows the same positive or right skew that we observe in a histogram for shock index. The median inside the box plot also provides information on the skewness of the distribution. If the median is at the center of the box, the distribution is symmetric. If the data have a left skew, then the median will be pulled to the right inside the box. If the data have a right skew, then the median will be pulled to the left in the box. This concludes our video on using graphs to understand data. Today we covered three types of graphs bar charts, box plots, and histograms. <laughs> <laughs>
This video provides a quick review of the measures of central tendency, including mean, median, and mode, variation and dispersion, range, quartiles and interquartile range, sample variance, standard deviation, and the normal curve, as well as the 68-95-99.7 rule. Before we begin, here's a quick review of symbols we'll use in this video. We will also use the abbreviation IQR for interquartile range. The mean is the average or balancing point. To find the mean, find the sum of all the values divided by the sample size. Here's a simple example of calculating the mean of the age of several participants in a study. The sigma is the sum, and the x-bar is the sample mean. After adding the values together and dividing by the number of values, 8, we arrive at our mean, 23.25. We can construct means of binary variables. The mean of a binary variable represents the percentage of ones. The mean is affected by extreme values, which is why we often look at means in conjunction with medians to understand how the data are distributed. In this example, the mean of the values 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 is calculated by adding the values together to make 15, then dividing the values by 5. The mean of this group is 3. However, if the values are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 10, the mean shifts to 4. The median is the middle value of the data. In this example, we have seven different ages. To find the mean, we first order them from smallest to largest and then locate the value in the center. However, if we have an even number of observations, median is computed as the average of the two middle values. The median is not impacted by outliers. Here, our median of the five values is three. If we add the value 10 to the set of values, our median is still three. The mode is the value that occurs most frequently. It is only useful when we have some values clustering together. In this example, the mode is 9. There may be no mode, or there may be several modes. There is no single measure of center that is best. If the data are normally distributed, then mean is used. However, if data are not normally distributed, the median is a better measure. Often we use both to understand the underlying structure of the distribution. There are several measures to examine the spread of the data. They include range, percentiles, interquartile range, and variance or standard deviation. The range is the difference between the largest and the smallest value. This histogram shows a minimum value of 15 and a maximum value of 94. The range is 94 minus 15 equals 79. Another measure of spread is the value of each quartile. We take the total number of data points we have and divide them into four parts. The value corresponding to the endpoint of each part is the quartile value. The interquartile range is the difference between the value at the third quartile minus the value at the first quartile. The first quartile, Q1, is the value for which 25% of the observations are smaller and 75% are larger. The second quartile, Q2, is the same as the median. 50% are smaller and 50% are larger. Only 25% of the observations are greater than the third quartile. Let's take the age values 15, 35, 49, 65, and 94. The first quartile is at 35. This means that 25% of the participants are below age 35. Likewise, 25% are above 65 years old. The interquartile range is 65 minus 35 equals 30 years. Sample variance is calculated as the average of squared deviations of values from the mean as shown here. We square the differences from the mean to provide equal weight to observations below the mean versus those above the mean. Because we square the difference, values that are further away from the mean get higher weight than those close to the mean. Standard deviation is the most commonly used measure of variation. It shows the variation around the mean and has the same units as the original data. It is calculated by finding the square root of the variance. Here's an example of the standard deviation using age data. Note that sample standard deviation is represented by the symbol S. X bar represents the sample mean. The standard deviation is an extremely useful measure. It tells us how close or far apart data are from the mean. The higher the standard deviation, the greater the spread of the data. Here in red is an example of a moderate standard deviation. You can see that the data is spread pretty evenly. The purple shows a low standard deviation, in which the data is concentrated near the middle. The blue example shows a high standard deviation, where the data is concentrated on the outside. These formulas are important to know well. While software can compute these for you, it's important to know how it's done using simple numbers. Whenever you work with data, you'll have variables that have a center and spread. A very useful rule to know is that no matter what the shape of the distribution, 75% of values will lie within two standard deviations of the mean, 
while 89% will lie three standard deviations from the mean. So if someone gives you just these two pieces of information, you can make some predictions on where a new data point will lie. However, what's even better in statistics is knowing that for large samples, data are distributed symmetrically and follow the bell curve. The 68-95-99.7 rule states that 68% of the area of a normal curve lies within one standard deviation of the mean, 95% of the area lies within two standard deviations of the mean, and 99.7% of the area lies within three standard deviations of the mean. This rule works for all normal curves, no matter their shape. That concludes our video on measures of central tendency including mean, median, and mode, variation and dispersion, range, quartiles and interquartile range, sample variance, standard deviation, the normal curve, and the 68-95-99.7 rule. <laughs>